Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hi everyone and welcome to On The House, the Household Management Science Insights Podcast, produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with expert knowledge from professionals in the field. I'm your host, Gabriella Yastra, coming to you from NAM, Melbourne, Australia. Let's get started. Hi everyone and welcome back to the show. Today we're going to be talking about the joy and benefits of growing your own herb garden with Amanda Schiffler, who is a freelance writer with a master's degree in agronomy and a bachelor's in horticulture. Hi, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining me. Um, So that we get to know you a little bit better, um, we'd love to know a bit more about you. Do you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Um, I'm a single mom of three and have spent most of my life being involved in plants in different ways, um, from growing up on a farm to working in greenhouses. And I have 25 years of experience doing my own landscaping and gardening and cultivating close to 50 house plants that my kids make fun of me for. So lots of plant experience. It's what I do. It's what I love. And I enjoy sharing all of that with Anybody that's willing to, to listen. 50 house plants. Yes. Do you have any space to live? Not a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> I love that though. That's, that's, um, that's the dream for me. I've got uh, like sort of 15 dead or dying ones. Right. It, they definitely, it has been a, somewhat of a slow process, but One of the nice things is as they get bigger, I can propagate them and all of a sudden I have, instead of one plant, I have three. And so that's really nice. Yeah, that's great. And then um, I've done that with a few of mine that have done a bit better and I give them to friends because there's only so many of one you need. Yes, exactly. Right. We've Mm. learned, I've gotten to the point where we've started moving them through the house. And so we propagated a bunch of stuff um, just a couple of weekends ago. And now my kids have their own sections of house plants that sit on their windowsills in their bedroom. So it's nice. It's oh, that's fun. great. I, it's been really enjoyable to see that passed on to them and to see them enjoy it. So that's great. Um, so we're going to do a section that we like to call, have you met Amanda, where we get to know you a bit more through some of your favorite things. Um, so the first thing you'd like to know is what is your favorite book? Right now I'm reading one that is going to go quickly to the top of the list of my favorites. And it's called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. And it's definitely not a f- fictional read. It's not something that's fun. But it talks about... Um, how we do so much in our day-to-day life that is unconscious, things such as brushing your teeth or when you're driving and stuff like that. And it's teaching ourselves to be more aware of the things that we do and to change some of the habits and to change um, perhaps some of the ways that we talk to ourselves so that we're nicer to ourselves and we're more supportive and living in the present moment instead of focusing on the past. So that's been an interesting new addition to my life that's, lately. That's interesting. I mean, the idea of, I guess, changing yourself can be a bit scary, um, but who doesn't want to be better? I mean, I've got so many habits that I don't like. Right. And that was a big part of why I thought that this book would be helpful is to get in it science based and so it really helps you to understand based on you know the things that go on in your brain and neurons and stuff like that and so it's it's definitely been really helpful so far so great i'll have to look it up 
Um, and what about a movie you've enjoyed recently? I will fully admit that I am not a huge TV slash movie person. And so my free time is more spent either outside working in the garden or it is spent reading or with my kids. So I can't say I've really seen any new movies other than the long list of Disney films that my kids like to watch. So, And do you have a favorite there or no? Oh, selfishly, I should, it's, yes. Um, I am a tried and true fan of the classic Lion King, so. Great music there, love it. Yes, exactly, exactly, so you can't complain. (laughs) Exactly. Um, And what about podcasts? Um, Do you listen to any of them? I do. Um, I have a handful that I listen to, and this kind of goes hand in hand with what I'm doing right now for reading. Um, I really like We Can Do Hard Things by Glennon Doyle that talks about changing our personal habits and and related topics like that. But then I've started listening to a new one um, by a woman called Maggie Sterling. And the name of the podcast is Burn Fat With Your Brain. And it actually is looking at and deconstructing some of the common diet myths that we have grown up with and that have been prevalent in society in the last 15 or 20 years. And it is focusing on intuitive eating and learning to listen to our body and kind of kick some of those habits such as carbs are bad or sugar is bad, fat is bad, and getting rid of that and just focusing more on eating to feel good. Interesting. I like that. Um, I'll have to give that a listen because I think that like many people, um, got some interesting thoughts about eating and food that aren't necessarily true anymore. And the science has changed so much in the last, what, 20 years? Exactly. And even in the last, I mean, even in the last six or eight, it has changed considerably. And I, one of the driving forces behind some of that is I have two daughters, um, 12 and 16, and I'm trying to set a really good example for them. And they're both, they're both athletes. And so food is really important for fueling them in order to get out on the soccer field and to do well. And I have a lot of misconstrued beliefs because of how I was brought up. And so I'm trying to change those perceptions so that I can instill better habits with them. Things such as as simple as it's okay to have a bowl of ice cream at the, you know, after dinner or at the end of the day and you don't have to feel guilty about it, you know. And then it's more important to think about doing so intuitively you know, but, and to watch yourself and say, okay, I've eaten this and I'm full. I'm not going to finish the bowl, you know, but to eat to where you're comfortable and it's just changing the mindset that goes with it. Yeah. I found, um, sort of the same thing. Um, instead of, you know, trying to eat less, just when I'm full, don't eat so much so I don't feel sick. And I found I was Wait. doing that a lot. Um, and that was from my um, parents, you know, eat all, right. everything on your plate. Exactly. And I very, I grew up in that. And I have a feeling that I'm probably a little bit older than you are. But I had very much grew up in that same type of household that it was, you cleared your plate and then you could get up from the table. And those are hard habits to change. And so it's something, like I said, that I'm working on to try to instill healthier beliefs in my kids. So that's great. And uh, do you have a role model? Um, the, I don't necessarily have one specifically. I'm really fortunate that I have some really amazing, strong women in my life that I look up to. Um, my mom is a great example. She was a single mom from the time I was young and taught me to go after my dreams and, you know, to follow the things I want and to always work hard. 
And then also my kids are some of my greatest role models and just that they are amazing little humans and they have done so much more than what I ever could have accomplished at that age. And they're continuously teaching me new lessons and making me be a better person. So those are probably the main role models in my life. I love that your role models sort of surround you on, um, you know, an older generation to provide wisdom and younger generation, I guess, to inspire. Um, Yeah, exactly. And it's definitely, and it's, they give different perspectives for sure. And also at the same point, because they are family members, they are constantly affecting my life. And so that's helpful at the same time. Yes. Hmm. And has there been a course that you've completed that um, you found really inspiring? I will admit that lately there hasn't been a whole lot, but life with three kids and working keeps me pretty busy. And so my free time has been spent kind of just on that reading and listening to podcasts and, you know, trying to to become a better mom and a, and a better person for myself. So no courses right now, but maybe in the future. Yep. And I guess you have been applying some learnings and some, you know, things to your own life, even if you haven't done it in a, you know, um, formal way. Right. In a structured course. Definitely. Yeah. Great. Um, so how do you define household management? Household management to me is taking all of the activities, the day-to-day stuff, and even some of the bigger items that go on in the household and just making sure that everything runs efficiently and that it's done when it needs to be and the household keeps moving on. And what about some misconceptions about household management? I think probably one of the biggest misconceptions people have about household management is that it only entails what I guess I would consider the chores and the tasks. You know, it's people think that household management is making sure that the laundry is done and that the groceries are, you know, bought and in the refrigerator and stuff like that. But household management also should focus on the health and the happiness of the family within the home and the relationships and the environment that you are creating more so than just the steps that need to be done and the functional pieces to make sure that, you know, the electricity stays on or you know, you have a clean place to live. Interesting. So I guess more than just making sure that it's a livable space, but making it a home, making it right, exactly. um, happy. Right, exactly. And like I said, the health and happiness of everybody in the home is a big part of, in, like you said, the difference between having a house and having a home. I love that. Um, so we're going to be talking about herb gardens today. Can you tell me what what, a, what is a herb garden? When I think of a herb garden, I think of growing the plants that we use, I guess, that we're consuming. Not necessarily our vegetables and our fruits and stuff like that, but it's the plants that we use to to flavor our food. And it's the plants that we use for their, their homeopathic remedies, whether it be you know, chamomile for tea or feverfew or things like that. And so it's the cultivation of those things that help, I guess, kind of add flavor to our life in more ways than one. And are there any benefits to growing your own herbs? Oh, without a doubt. I think one of the biggest benefits is the fact that it makes anything you grow it just it's available right there at your fingertips whether it's on your kitchen windowsill or whether it's out your back door regardless of 
this season or, you know, just the fact I can't tell you how many times before I started to grow my own herbs that I would need cilantro or parsley or something like that for a recipe and forget to buy it. And then all of a sudden I'm starting to cook and I don't have it. And so having it available right at your fingertips is fantastic. But then to... I love knowing everything that went into its production. I know all of the fertilizers that are used. I know any, if there's been any kind of um, pesticide treatments or anything like that. And so it gives me a peace of mind that I know step by step. And a lot of things I have gotten to the point where I, I start my stuff from seed And so I'm not even buying plants from the greenhouse or from the nursery. And so I literally know everything that has been given to that plant since the time the seed germinated. Plus, I think one of the great benefits is just there's an immense amount of joy and satisfaction that comes with growing your own herbs and then adding them, you know, to your recipes. And it gives you that little bit of extra oh I did this myself and I think we all get enjoyment out of that definitely I started trying to grow my own basil Mm -hmm. and we made pasta and I chopped off three little basil leaves and put them on top of the pasta because that's all the basil I could have right but I felt very um, accomplished eating my basil Exactly. Exactly. And I will say too, that one of the benefits that I enjoy is that it's teaching my kids the science of food production. I mean, they're seeing it firsthand. They're seeing these seeds, these seeds germinate and grow. And it's not as though I'm just having them go to the refrigerator, you know, to go to the pantry and to grab stuff and then throw it into a recipe. They actually are helping to take care of these plants and watching them grow and mature. And I think that that lesson in itself is, is at least one of the benefits I see. And yeah, I do love um, watching them grow from seedlings up into proper full plants and, um, digging back into my biology days in high school and saying, oh, this is this bit and this is this part. And it's, it's such a great way to bring science and to bring that learning and understanding into your own home. I personally, it is. And, and I will admit to, um, my younger children, it's been really interesting as they learn about things such as photosynthesis and the water cycle and things like that. And just how, elements move through our environment. I mean, they can see those firsthand when we're growing new seeds, you know, or or growing plants in general. And I think it helps them in turn to go to school because they have a better idea of why sunlight is important for plants and, you know, how it helps to grow food or, you know, produce food within the plant and stuff like that. So great. Um, So as I mentioned, I do have my own um, little tiny um, herb garden. It's not doing particularly well. Um, So I guess I'd like to learn some hints from you as to um, what we should do to make it better. So I guess, first of all, where can I grow a herb garden? Is my planter box too small? Honestly, I think that's one of the best things about growing an herb garden is you can do it regardless of how much space you have. You can grow a single plant on your kitchen windowsill. Um, You can buy some of those small self-contained hydroponic units where you can grow three or four different types and just set it on your kitchen counter. Or you can grow large raised beds. I have a three-tiered raised bed out in my flower bed that is my herb garden and I probably grow six or eight different herbs in it. And so you're only limited with how much room you really have. And so 
like I said, you can start with one plant or you can grow many. It just depends on the space you have and what you, and two, it depends a lot, obviously, on what you're looking to grow. So is there anything, I guess, that's better to start with a small pot um, and anything that's, I guess, unsuitable to be inside the home? That's a really good question. One of the things I always tell people when they ask, what are good herbs to start with? The first question I ask is, what do you like? Because I think that's the most important thing is that it's essential to grow plants that you're actually going to enjoy, that you are going to use and you are going to eat. Some of the easiest ones I think to start with, especially indoors, basil is one of the really great ones. Um, It will grow really well. Things like parsley and cilantro also grow phenomenally, phenomenally. Oh, goodness. Phenomenally. (laughs) Um, of other really easy ones to grow indoors are uh, sage it will grow like crazy chives mint things like that they are those herbs that as long as they have the right amount of sunlight and you water them correctly they're going to grow like crazy um there's a couple that i recommend that are a little bit more challenging to grow Um, especially indoors. So if you are looking to grow rosemary or lavender, I think those plants are better suited to start outside. Number one, they can get quite large and take up a good deal of space, Um, but they can be a little bit more finicky. And so they're not always the best to grow when you're just starting. Um, And dill. Dill is easy to grow, but it gets really big. My dill plants were probably five feet tall last year. And so unless you have five, you know, unless you have a small human's worth of space in your kitchen, you might want to leave those outside. Oh, no, I I planted dill in my um, little planter box. In your planter next box. Next to the basil. Um, and they're doing quite well now. I mean, right. compared to the basil, but uh, maybe I'll have to take out a few and relocate them or right. eat them. I grew them. I I make my own pickles every year, and so I've decided to start growing my own dill, so I have it. And it resides in the top tier of my planter box outside of my three tier, and it is tall enough or was tall enough at the end of the season last year that I can see the heads of the dill at like level eye level with me when I was standing in the kitchen looking out the window. So it was pretty crazy. It got quite tall. So, and it's kind of funny because I'm now finding these teeny tiny little dill sprouts everywhere outside. And so it must have gone to seed and it shook the seeds all over. So we are going to have more dill than I know what to do with this year. So. That's great. I mean, that's right. also good to know as well um, that it, you know, it is very easy and it'll just plant itself. Um, right. It definitely does go to seed quite easily. So, And you also mentioned as well um, that, you know, you need to have the right amount of water and the right amount of sun for these different indoor herbs. Um, and I feel like that's a, such a hard thing to get right. Do you have any tips there? Um, I think sun is probably the easier one of those two components. Most of the herbs that we grow like to get a fair amount of sun um, or as pretty much as much sun as they would like. There's a few that you have to be careful that they don't do as well if you give them a bunch of really bright direct sunlight. I think one of the misconceptions that people have when they're growing plants indoors is that you want to set them in the window where the sun is beating through the window a huge amount of the day. And honestly, a lot of your plants, whether it be herbs or just houseplants in general, 
actually prefer to have indirect sunlight. And so that really bright sunlight, especially when it comes through the glass and the windows, because that glass can magnify some of the the sunlight and just the rays and the sun itself and can almost give the plants like an overload of sunlight. And so um, the window that I use above my kitchen sink where I do grow, like in the winter time, I will grow some herbs when it's too cold to grow them outside. It's nice because it doesn't get sun until later in the afternoon. And so it's not one of those windows that has sunlight from eight in the morning until, you know, eight or nine o'clock at night and has it where it just beats down on it and the entire time. So I think that's one of the things that you need to be careful about. Obviously, on the other side of that, there's also the problem of not getting enough sunlight. And that can be one of the major challenges of growing indoors. Um, and I say one of the easiest ways to do that is to to compensate for that is to just buy a small little like LED light. You can buy, I actually buy the strips that have got like the, um, the adhesive on the back that you can pull like the tape strip off of it and they just stick right up underneath your counter or your, not your counters, your cabinets in the kitchen. And that's a great way to add extra light if you're struggling, if you don't have enough space in your house to grow herbs or even just other plants in general. And those lights are nice because you can customize them in terms of how long they're on, you know, and usually probably eight or 10 hours of those LED lights is enough to give your herbs what they need to grow really well. Um, But the second component that I think people struggle with, and I will admit that I even have trouble with this sometimes, is that we tend to overwater our plants. And there's a lot of plants that don't like to be soggy. I mean, I can't blame them. Nobody likes soggy feet. Plants are no different. And so one of the things to be really cautious about is just to make sure that the potting soil is starting to dry out a little bit. Like and all you need to do really is just touch kind of the top of it and see if the top of it is starting to dry out before you give it water again. Because if you do, if you do give it too much water, the problem is then the plants aren't getting as much oxygen through the roots. What people sometimes don't understand is that whether you're growing plants outside in just the garden, like in your regular soil in the ground, or whether you're growing them in potting soil or some other sort of growing substrate, in between whatever it is that you're growing in, there's space in between the soil particles or in between the pieces of potting soil or the vermiculite or whatever. And in that space, you have both oxygen and water that hang out there and then nutrients too of course when you fertilize and your plants need oxygen they need to be able to take oxygen in it through the roots so when you over water you're constantly pushing that oxygen out of that root zone out of that pore space and it's just filled with water and so in essence you're drowning your plants and so they're not getting the oxygen that they need for the metabolic functions that they're trying to do. And so that's one of the problems that people don't understand. It's one of those that, oh, if a little bit of water is good, then a lot of water is better. And unfortunately, that's not the case. So I always, one of the first things I recommend to anybody that's struggling with growing herbs or any plant in general is to scale back on the water, make sure it's getting enough sunlight, but it's not getting burnt by too much sunlight and kind of let off the watering just a little bit. Let it be a little bit more on the dry side and see if that helps. Okay. Um, Possibly a silly question because I've never thought about the idea of oxygen in soil. Do you need to do anything to make sure there's enough oxygen in the soil? No. um, 
not on a regular basis. One of the most important things, like I said, is making sure that you're not putting too much water, that you're not overwatering your plants. But then to another thing that you can do, especially when you're potting new plants, is don't compact to the soil super, super hard all the way around it. I mean, you definitely want to tamp the soil down enough so that you're getting rid of the large air pockets around the roots. But you don't want to push it down so hard that you're compacting it because what that does too is then it's depleting that pore space and then it makes it so that there's not room for either oxygen or water to hang out. And so instead of when you, so then when you go to water your plants, instead of the water percolating down through the soil to get into the root zone, it's just going to sit on top or it's going to run off. And so... Yeah, I guess that's kind of the other big thing is to make sure that you're not just packing that soil down and getting rid of that space for the oxygen. Interesting. Um, Yeah, I haven't thought about that. So thank you. Um, So you also mentioned um, some different types of herbs. um, And I was wondering, do some of them... Do some of them die off at the end of the year um, or at the end of a season? um, Or... Are they supposed to last all year round and I'm just a bad plant mom? No, you are definitely not a a bad plant mom. Um, A lot of the herbs that we grow are, they are what they consider, they have an annual life cycle. And so that means that their growth is such that the seed germinates, we're going to say in the spring, but whenever the conditions are right, the seed will germinate. The plant is then programmed genetically that it wants to grow, 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 and mature, go to flower, put out seed, and then it's going to die off all within a single growing season. And then that seed will then carry on the genetic information the next year. So a lot of the things we grow, basil, cilantro, parsley, are plants that are genetically made to only grow for one single season. When we move them indoors, and if we are cautious about not letting them flower and not letting them develop seed heads, you can grow them for considerably longer than that because we're tricking their genetics and we're making them think that instead of a growing season being four or five or six months or wherever it is, depending on your local climate, that we just have this inordinately long time that they can grow. And so as long as they're happy, they will grow. After some point, I mean, you might, regardless of how well you take care of a plant, it's going to say, I'm, I'm done. You know, it's kind of, it's just, it's, I mean, it's a lot similar to human life or, you know, to the pets that we have and stuff like that, that sometimes it's just the natural course and it's going to just happen that way. And if you, obviously, if you are growing things outside, it's going to be different depending on your local climate. Like for me, where I am in the United States, Come October or November, November, we're going to get down into really cold temperatures and have snow and frost and nothing's going to grow outside. And so even the hardiest plants, you know, my, my lavender comes back every year. Um, The cold weather will kill it. It will kill all of the green you know, the leaves and the flowers and stuff like that. But then it will regenerate and regrow come spring. Once the weather gets nice and the temperatures start to warm up again. But for the most part, the stuff that's really leafy, you know, like oregano and basil and, you know, things like that are just meant to grow for a single season and some of the plants that have 
the woodier stems like rosemary and lavender and even thyme, you can extend that or they might grow for multiple seasons, especially if you have a more temperate climate or you are just primarily growing indoors. And you also said that you can kind of trick the plants into thinking it's a really long season. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Um, there's three key things that you have to do with that. Um, the most important of that being you want to make sure that the plant doesn't naturally start to flower on its own. Um, and this is where the other two things come into play because there's two environmental conditions that will make a plant flower. And one of those is the temperature and then also the day length or not, or the amount of sun, like the time from when the sun comes up until when it goes down at the end of the day. When temperatures start to get really hot in the summertime, it triggers the plant to send up flowers because it knows following summer, we're going to go into fall and we're going to go into winter. And so if it wants to produce seed and carry on that genetic information, it has to flower. So when the temperatures start to climb, it'll automatically send up flowers. So one of the things that you can do to extend the life of your herbs is when you start to see those little buds of flowers on your plant, sniff them off, whether you pinch them with your fingers or you clip them with, you know, a little pair of shears or whatever. Um, because what that does is then it changes the hormones within the plant and the plant no longer thinks that it's ending its life cycle and that will keep it so that it's like, okay, I need to keep going and I need to produce more flowers because I need to set seed. Um, and the day length will also do that because once we reach that point and obviously we're in different areas of, of the planet and so it's a little bit different, but say for me, when we reach the longest days in June and we have the most amount of sun, once those days start to shorten again, it does the same thing as what happens when the temperature gets really high is the plant sees that as an environmental cue and says, okay, the days are shortening, which means winter's coming. And so we need to send up flowers so that we can produce seed. And so it's the most important thing is just making sure then that your plant doesn't go to seed because once it puts up that flower and it goes to seed, that's kind of, that's, it's telling itself that its life cycle is done and it's completed the things, it's gone through and has checked off all the things on its to-do list and so it's, okay, I'm done. I don't need to do this anymore. And so if you can keep it from flowering, you can get it to grow for considerably longer. Like I said, as long as you are making sure that it has the right amount of sunlight and the right amount of water, and it does need to be fertilized, but that's kind of another area where people struggle, especially when, you, when you're growing herbs and um, kind of goes with water that people think, oh, a little bit of fertilizer is good, so a lot of fertilizer must be even better. And with all plants, that is actually really incorrect. And so we can create toxicities within the plants that can be dangerous to them. Um, one of the things with herbs, though, and people don't realize this, is that if you over fertilize, especially with nitrogen fertilizer with herbs, you're going to affect the flavor and you're going to dilute the flavor profile because what happens is nitrogen is, is what primarily fuels foliage growth. And so we want to, whether you're growing a lawn or you're growing houseplants or whatever, or even early on when you're growing herbs, 
you want them to have plenty of nitrogen so that they will grow and put out green leaves and their stems will elongate and stuff like that. But you reach a point where with herbs, you want that growth to kind of slow down. Um, it's kind of a way to describe it. Say, for instance, that you had... No, I'm trying to think of a good way to do this. So you is had like, 10... go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, is it like if you have like a cup of tea and then you poured more water into it, then the tea would be more dilute because there's more yes. water. Exactly. And so that's what happens is you have these, um, you have these organic compounds, you know, these, these, I can't think of the word I want right now, but these the essential oils and stuff like that that are giving you know the basil and the rosemary and stuff like that their flavor there's a specific amount of those and if you boost the vegetative growth too much the plant doesn't have enough time to make more of these essential oils and so the same amount then is going to be spread through a larger plant and so you're going to lose out on the flavor it's going to make it so that your flavor isn't intense i mean you want your plant to have some fertilizer because obviously especially when it's growing in a container there's only a specific amount of fertilizer in that container and as the plant grows and as it pulls that out it depletes those nutrients in there and there's nutrients that regardless of what type of plant it is there's just over a dozen different nutrients that are considered essential for plant growth. And if the plant doesn't have those nutrients, it is things like nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium, but then also calcium and magnesium and stuff like that. If they don't have those nutrients, you're going to impact growth negatively. So as they pull the nutrients out of the potting soil or whether you're using peat moss or cocoa core or whatever, it's going to use up those nutrients. And so we do need to replenish them, but you just need to be careful about how you do so because if you give them too much, you're going to make it so that your herbs don't taste as good. And so... So how how do you know how much to, to fertilize them? <laughs> That's a good question. I'm not a... Uh, some days I just guess. Um, I shouldn't say that. And I really think one of the things I found when it comes to growing herbs is to be very cautious about the type of fertilizer that you use. And with those plants, I tend to use um, organic fertilizers that will release nutrients slowly. But at the same point, these organic fertilizers, things such as um, liquid seaweed fertilizer. I'm a huge fan of liquid seaweed fertilizer. Um, other things, fish emulsions, compost teas, things like that. Um, they have a lower concentration of these nutrients in it. And so you can water, you can add them into your water and when you water your herbs, whether it be every four or five days or, you know, a week, just depending on what your schedule is like and what your plant needs are, some of these lower sources of fertilizer, I think it's perfectly acceptable to add them most of the time, you know, or even every other time that you water, um, I usually will do, like I use a compost tea for my houseplants and stuff. And I will usually use that about once a month unless it, if I notice that I'm seeing some problems with growth, then I will do it more than that. But I tend to err on the side of caution and probably under fertilize them a little bit, which I'm not going to let my master's advisor know that I said that. 
<laughs> because my <laughs> master's is in plant nutrition and he would probably yell at me. But um, no, I personally, I would rather kind of scale back a little bit and then whether it be if you want to add some of these fertilizers every time that you water, you can do like a third or a half of what the directions are on the label or you can do a full dose and maybe do it, you know, every three or four times you water it. It just depends. Um, but that's my recommendation, you know, is mm. is to focus on some of these or to use these, you know, the fertilizers that are these more natural sources of nutrients. And one of the things that um, is also really beneficial when you use things like liquid seaweed fertilizer especially is that um it has so much more than just nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium but it also contains beneficial like carbohydrates and there's um microbes and amino acids and things like that that you're not finding and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with products like miracle Grow or, you know, some of your, your quick acting chemical fertilizers. I will admit there's times where I want to give my plants a boost of something really quick and I will use one of those. But when you're using these organic products, they have all of these other components in them that are going to help build the soil structure and they're going to help hold water in the soil and do more things than just your basic chemical fertilizer and so it kind of helps it's almost like a holistic approach and it, it's a whole plant or a whole health system instead of just it would be no different than instead of just taking a multivitamin every day for your own personal nutrition it would be no different than focusing on eating healthy foods you know that are going to give you that same nutrient boost but then also provide you with you know fiber and those sort of things if that makes sense yeah so like eating a wide variety of food rather than having multivitamins where you're going right, to lose exactly. out a lot of these other right. things Instead of, you know, trying to make up for a poor diet by just taking a pill, um, I think sometimes the use of chemical fertilizers is kind of synonymous with that, you know, where we could we can do a lot more for our plants and, you know, their growth and their health if we, you know, can add these, you know, the bacteria and, you know, like I said, amino acids and things like that. So once we've grown our plants and they're looking really healthy and lovely, um, what do we do with them? Like, how, what's the best way to harvest them or, or keep them? One of the things that I always tell people is harvest them as often as you can. Mm -hmm. The best things that we can do when we're growing herbs is because the more we cut back those stems, the more it's going to trigger new growth. And it's also going to help when we cut off the top of the plant, normally the way an herb grows or a way plants grow in general is they have a main growing point at the top of the plant and that's where all of the growth comes out. And if you cut that off, it triggers side branches to grow more. And so it's going to create a nice full bushy thick herb versus something that's kind of tall and spindly. So our so harvest as often as you can. And how you do it is really a personal preference thing. I'll admit that nine times out of 10, I go outside and I just snip stuff off with, you know, my thumbnail and my finger. Things, and that works really well with some of these softer, like leafy herbs. Like we talked, you know, well, I'm going to go back to basil because it's one of my favorites and I grow so much of it. But things like that and sage and mint, those are all really great for just pinching off what you need. 
whenever you need them. Um, some of your other ones, your rosemary and lavender and thyme, and if you're growing some of your things, chamomile, you know, things like that that might have a little bit more of a woody stem. I really like, and it might sound kind of silly, but I have these really small, um, they're actually embroidery shears from when I was sewing a lot. And they're just like a little, I don't, probably, I would say four inch. So probably what is that? About 10 centimeters in metric. But they have these really sharp points at the ends. And they're super great because you can get into small spaces. And then it makes it easy to harvest what you want. And then too, I have a pair that I just use for harvesting herbs out of the garden. And I don't have to worry that they're clean. I don't have to worry that my kids were cutting who knows what with them and you know I don't know what kind of sticky substance is now going to be you know on my herbs I guess that is one important thing when you are using um whether it be kitchen shears or whether you have a, a dedicated pair of garden shears is that you make sure that they're clean is so to wash them soap and water works great I know some people will rub them down with rubbing alcohol or, you know, something like that. But one thing to remember is that when we are harvesting, we're cutting through those plant stems and we're exposing the internal parts of the plant. And so if there are, if there's dirt or something, you know, from your kitchen or inside your home that you run the risk of, if those scissors aren't clean, that that could get inside your plant and then it can cause problems. Or if you have one plant that, unfortunately, if it has a disease or, you know, it has something wrong with it and you're not cleaning your shears in between, then you run the risk of transferring from one plant mm -hmm. to another. So, I mean, it's pretty similar to humans, you know, you right. want to, if you have to do surgery or something, you don't want to use the surgical right, you, tools from someone else. Right. You want it to be clean and you want it to be sterile. Um, and I mean, and you can go out. There are really, there are really fun tools that you can buy online and through different, re you know, retailers, but there are specific herb shears that have ends that are kind of curved on them. Um, and I'm not quite sure even how to explain them, but the whole idea is that you can, when you go to use them, the tip kind of curves so that it isn't, you don't run the risk of nicking someplace else, you know, or cutting onto a different stem. Um, I will admit a lot of times when it comes to my gardening tools, I go for really simple and a lot of what I use has been multi-purposed from something else somewhere in the house. And so, I mean, those, those things are great, but honestly, clean hands and a simple pair, you know, of just small scissors are some of the best things to use when it comes to harvesting. I guess use what you've got and if you are looking to buy something, you know, you could go and purchase the ones with the rounded nose. Um, right, yeah. exactly. And, you know, and not, it just depends, you know, and I know I have friends that love all the, the fun gadgets and tools and stuff like that. And if that's what you want to do, that that's great. You know, I just, whatever, whatever it takes to get you to grow plants and to enjoy what you're doing, that's what matters. So. Perfect. Great. So um, once once we've harvested all our herbs, um, what do I do with them? Like, how do I store them? I've seen in shops them like hanging down from the roof. Is that a good way or any other suggestions? <laughs> Drying herbs is probably one of the easiest ways to store them and present, preserve them. But the drawback with that is that you will lose some of the flavor as the moisture leaves, you know, um, 
it's going to change the profile a little bit, the flavor profile. But then at the same point, over time, you're going to lose some of the intensity of those aromatic compounds that are giving you the flavor. Um, one of the great things is there is a ton of different ways that you can store them and preserve them. And it all depends on what you want to do with them. Um, I will admit, I do dry things. Um, sage is one that I do tend to dry a lot whether it be in my food dehydrator or I just do that where I tie a clump together and I hang it downstairs in the room where I keep like my canned goods and, you know, stuff like that. Um, but there's also, you can make, I don't think many people realize, but you can make pestos out of just about any leafy herb that you have. And so you can make pestos and then you can freeze them. Like you can put them in an ice cube tray and freeze them, which is a great way. And then you could just pop them out and add them to soups or to sauces or, you know, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, you can put them in either oil or you can put them in vinegar um, and make infusions that way. And then you can use those especially if you do it with oils, um, you can use those like as a base if you're frying or you're, you're sauteing vegetables or meats or whatever, and it'll help to impart those flavors into your foods. Um, one, another really fun way, if you have a bunch of rosemary or mint or lavender or things like that, I will put them, I will chop them up and into smaller pieces and put them in ice cream trays and then fill them with water and freeze them. And then you can put them directly into drinks, whether you're making lemonade or you're making, you know, cocktails. I mean, super fun to throw in, you know, mint ice cubes if you're making mojitos or, you know, doing whatever. And so there are a lot of different ways where you can make, um, there's things like compound butters where you can take butter and soften it and then add, chopped up herbs to it um and then you can then freeze that butter and then just pull it out you know and use pats of butter another way to you know flavor sauces or to thicken sauces and things like that or even just something as simple as if you have homemade bread or even just regular bread or rolls that you can use that compound butter to get that flavor so there's that a ton of different delicious. ways Right. And now I'm hungry. Right. But yeah, there's so many yeah. different ways. Um, it really just depends on a lot of it depends on the time you have and the space you have to work with um, and really just how creative you want to be. And so I th but I will admit to you that I really think I mean, you do like I said, you do lose a little bit of the flavor sometimes when you dry them. But I still think that drying my own herbs at home I still get better flavor than when I buy dried stuff from the grocery or from the market you know and I think that's because it goes along with that whole idea that anything that you grow at home tends to have better flavor because it's fresh and you don't know how long some of the stuff has sat on the shelves in the store and so it just, you know, I think it's, even if you do have to dry it and you do lose some of the flavor, it's still going to be better than what you can buy. And I was thinking as well, when you were explaining um, how the flavor gets diluted by nitrogen and Rip. the growth, um, I was wondering if supermarkets do that um, to their own herbs that they sell, because I've noticed that a lot of the herbs you get in supermarkets don't have nearly as much flavor as sometimes what you get in restaurants or in smaller grocery stores. Right. And I think a lot of that just, I think some of it depends on the, the grocery itself on the, you know, the individual market and how much time and attention that they can give. Um, there's probably some places like when you go into the into the store and 
you can buy those prepackaged little clear like plastic clam shells you know that have cilantro oh, yes. or parsley or or whatever i would imagine that those plants are being produced in bulk in a greenhouse and the main goal of that grower is to produce as much leafy green material as possible in as short of time as they can and so they're going to throw a ton of nitrogen fertilizer at it because they want it to grow really fast and so they can harvest it and package it and send it off and so like you said it it is going to dilute the flavor whereas opposed to if you go especially to some of these like little I don't know if I want to say specialty restaurants or, you know, some of these restaurants that are really focusing on sourcing locally and growing their own, their own food. They're really going to take the time and they're going to put the love and the attention into growing the highest quality. And they're going to focus on quality over quantity. And so they're going to make sure that they're not over fertilizing because they want the best tasting product. And so that probably has a lot to do with the difference that you see in flavor between things. And I mean, but it also, it's probably similar to when we go to some of these large groceries that have some of the most horrible tasting tomatoes because (laughs) they've got a grower that their only goal is to just produce fruit and get it on the shelf someplace and You know, when you go someplace else and whether it be a smaller market or whatever, where their, their focus is more on selling good tasting product. Yeah. So. Definitely. Um, And I realized I don't like, it's not that I don't like tomatoes. Mm -hmm. I just don't like the tomatoes you buy at the big supermarkets with no flavor. Right. I don't like them either. And I do yeah. not like, I do not like ones that I get when I go to a restaurant in the middle of winter. The ones that are just that really gross, light pink color and have that really bad tech. I love tomatoes when they come right out of my garden and my kids are the same way. You know, I, two of three of my kids like tomatoes, but they won't eat them at a restaurant in the middle of the winter that they only like them when they come out of the garden. So there's a lot to be said about growing your own. Lucky kids too. Yes. Yes. <laughs> mm. um, so what's something, what's a practice that you do in your own home or your own garden that um, to improve your um, food practices? Um. I think one of the big things that I do both within the home and when it comes to my garden that helps me is just basic planning um, and trying to implement ways that it makes my life easier and maybe even to help kind of prevent problems. Um, my life is pretty chaotic. I'm a single mom with three kids and we have school and soccer and band and all sorts of activities. And obviously I work full time and planning helps me keep it all on track and keeps it all together. And it helps to keep my house running efficiently. Um, And I know that that doesn't work for some people. And I have friends that I know and even family members that will just kind of shake their head and kind of make fun of me for sometimes the extent of what I do, but I have to have things written down and, you know, we sit together as a family on Sunday morning and talk about all the commitments that we have for the week and we plan meals together as a family so that we have an idea on busy nights that I have something that I can make and put together quickly or I can make ahead of time so that I know my kids are still getting a healthy meal, you know, and, but I do the same thing, you know, once 
we get further along in the growing season and I have more, I have produce that's available right here at my fingertips. Planning helps me so that I can maximize that use, you know, and I can get the most use out of those things and say, okay, we have way too many tomatoes and I don't want any of them to go to waste. So when we sit down and make our meal plan for the week, we can incorporate spaghetti sauce or lasagna, you know, or things like that, that use more tomatoes. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's the only way that I can keep everything running and not have the wheels fall off some days. <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I don't grow my own food. I don't have kids, but I do find I'll buy, I don't know, some some herbs from the supermarket. I'll use half of them and I'll say, oh, I'll use the rest of them later in the week. I don't plan it out properly. Right. And they end up in the compost. Exactly. And, you know, but that's also one of the things that I find when I do my, my food planning or my menu planning is I might do um, something like I might roast a whole chicken or, you know, more than one early in the week or to grill up a bunch of chicken breast. And then, um, I can then plan that directly into meals on another day later that week, instead of just putting it in the refrigerator and telling myself that we're going to eat leftovers where I actually put it into the plan, then, it makes sure that I'm cutting down on food waste and things like that. And that's something that's really important to me is to try to maximize the things that we have, you know, and to get the most use out of them and and not be throwing things away. I mean, yeah, it's nice to have stuff to add to the compost pile so that I'm continuously feeding the compost pile. But at the same point, I don't want to be wasting my money and, you know, these resources and just throwing stuff away. Definitely. Uh, so we've got um, a few questions from the audience today. Okay. Um, so our first one is, um, how, uh, what are some uh, tips or techniques um, for starting a herb garden for someone with limited space? Um, I think the first thing is to sit down and think about the herbs that you use the most Um, because you want to maximize the space that you have. And there's no point in growing something such as tarragon if it's not something that you use regularly. So look at maybe the top two or three herbs that you use the most in your recipes. And then take a look, walk through your house walk or your apartment or wherever it is that you have and really take a look and see what space you have available. Because I think people sometimes underestimate where they can grow things. I mean, something as simple, um, you can buy the plant hangers, like the macrame or, you know, the those plant hangers, and you can grow herbs from the curtain rod in your living room or in your bedroom if you have enough sunlight um you can look at your kitchen window or you can grow them on the bathroom windowsill i mean you're not limited to just one specific place in your house so look at first look at the ones that your family uses the most and then really take a hard look and get creative about where you could potentially grow things and then Um, another thing that I recommend for people is that when it comes to herbs, and this goes along with what we were talking about, about making sure that you don't overwater them. Um, you want to take a look and see what the watering requirements are for certain herbs, because there's some that do like the soil to stay a little bit more wet than others. And so that will dictate the kind of container that you use. And some people aren't aware of this, but if you have something, use lavender as an example, even though it's not necessarily consumed as much as some of the other herbs. Lavender likes to be dry. It likes arid conditions and it likes dry soil. 
one of the best ways to grow lavender indoors is to put it into terracotta pots. The standard orange ones that we all know so well. Not necessarily the pretty ones that have been painted and they're nice and glossy. Those standard terracotta clay pots have really good air movement. And so when you water your plant, that soil's not going to stay as wet. And so that's really helpful for something that likes a dry climate. Um, and there are some of your some of your herbs that are native to some regions, like mountainous regions in the Mediterranean, where they are used to rocky, dry soils. They're going to do better in containers that don't hold the moisture. But some herbs that like their roots to be a little bit more wet, they're going to want just your standard like plastic containers because the plastic, the air movement isn't going to be as much through the walls of the container. And so the soil is going to stay more wet. Um, but going along with that, you can use that to your advantage. And if you're trying to grow multiple herbs in one place, you can group together plants that have similar watering requirements in one container. And instead of growing three individual containers, you can buy one container that's a little bit bigger and actually group more plants in it. You just want to be careful that you're not putting them in too close to one another. But you'll actually maximize space if you can use a larger container versus smaller ones. You just have to make sure that you are, like I said, that you're grouping them together based on what their watering requirements are. Because you obviously yes. don't want to put one herb that likes its roots to be dry right next to something that wants a lot of water because then one of them is not going to be happy. <laughs> yep. No, definitely not. Right. So yeah, that's kind of my big tips is to think about what you really want and to, to choose the herbs that you're going to get the most use out of. To take a look at your space and see where you have good sunlight. Or like I said, you know, to buy um, a supplemental light, whether it be something that goes under your cabinet or whatever. Um, and then make sure that you have the right containers. And then you can group things together based on their requirements and be able to grow more in a small space. Great. Thank you. So our second audience question is, how does the act of growing and nurturing herbs impact one's relationship with food and cooking? And how does this enhance overall enjoyment and satisfaction? I think, well, we've talked, to, we've touched on this at the beginning, and just when it comes to satisfaction, that there's a lot um, a personal satisfaction, I think, that we get when we're adding these herbs that we've grown ourselves to recipes. Um, there's a sense of pride and accomplishment that comes with it. Um, I also think that having your own herb garden and trying new new flavors, I think it really helps us or encourages us to try new things and to try new foods. Um, case in point, we try every year to put one new vegetable in the garden that my kids don't necessarily like, but they're more open to try it if it's something that they've helped to grow themselves and they've helped to to go out and even just harvest it out of the herb garden for me if I'm making dinner or even to just potentially try new recipes that they hadn't thought of before because it was something that, you know, we grew right here. That's great. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much for talking about um, herb gardens today. I've learned so much about um you know, all these different uh, ways to grow herbs, but also you, you've given us some great ideas on how to use those herbs because um, even though I don't grow many herbs, I've definitely ended up with too many herbs from a shopping expedition 
Right. Um, and I think you can use those tips even if you don't have a garden. So thank you so much for that. Um, You're welcome. So if, if people want to find out more about you, um, where can they find you? Um, one of the things, the first that I'm going to recommend, and there's a fantastic website called Herbs at Home, and it's herbsathome.co. And I'm one of the primary writers, and it I've covered topics from growing individual herbs to the different growing mediums, fertilizers, lights, anything that you can think of. Um, and there's actually a really, really good ebook that's available. Um, it's like the insider's guide or the enthusiast guide to growing herbs. It talks about 35 of the most common herbs and it breaks them down and it says, okay, in order to grow parsley, this is a light requirement. You know, this is how much water it needs. And it even, it tells you plants that it grows really well with different ways you can use it for culinary uses. It's a fantastic resource. Um, beyond that, if you want to find out more about me, um, you can head directly to my website, amandashiffler.com. There's different ways you can contact me through email if you have questions specifically. Um, you can also find different work that I have done online if you're interested in hearing more about um, landscaping content or um like fruit trees and gardening and, you know, outside stuff, you can go to lawnstarter.com um, or even just do a simple Google search and you can find information on me all over the place. Great. Thank you. We'll put those websites in the uh, show notes for everyone to find. I don't think I could even name, what was it, 36 herbs? Right. There's a few of them that I had never thought of, you know, growing myself, but it's also, I mean, there's a, once you get into some of the more, um, specialized cuisines, you know, um, whether it be Korean or some of the other Asian, you know, fairs that there are things that are definitely more specific, you know, or tailored right to those, but and to a lot of those, I think we tend to overlook, you know, some of the things like I talked about, um, chamomile and feverfew and some of these things that are definitely used more as homeopathic remedies, you know, that are still very much classified as herbs and not just, you know, the basil and the oregano and things like that. Yeah, I, I've never heard of Fever Few, so I'm going to go home and look that up. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. You're um, and uh, thanks, I've learned so much. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. Thank you. You've been listening to On the House, produced by the Household Management Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes like this from across 10 life management perspectives can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, and any other podcasting apps available on your smart devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating, sharing, and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people to find it so we can grow and continue to bring you quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website, hm.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Gabriella Yastra. Thanks for tuning in.